Hey guys, welcome back to another Proto Star Binary Exploit. In this video, we're going to be doing Stack 5. This is, uh, I think, probably the most interesting one that we have here. So, uh, let's go take a look at the problem statement. So, about. Stack 5 is standard buffer overflow, this time introducing shell code. Um, and we have a couple of hints here. It might be easier to use someone else's shell code. You will definitely be doing that. And then this is some stuff about debugging the shell code. Which we're not really going to worry about because the shell code is going to be pretty much, um, uh, it's going to be fine. Um, as long as we pick some good shell code, then this will work properly. So here's the source code. We have an int main function here. We have a buffer. And we have just gets. Wow, two instructions here. And we should be able to exploit this whole system. So shell code, if you um, haven't seen it before, is basically um, uh, a series of uh, instructions, uh, usually encoded as bytes. Uh, it's usually a very small, uh, quote-unquote, program um, that can spawn a shell uh, in, in applications such as a buffer overflow like this. And we're going to be looking at that um, as we do this. So first thing we want to do is just let's take a look at the program and see what happens. So right now I've opened up Protostar and it's in uh, Secure Shell here. So let's take a look at the disassembly of Stack 5 real quick. It shouldn't be something that we're too surprised about, but okay, so we want to take a look at Stack 5. Oh, <laughs> disassemble main. All right. So this is the entire main function here. It's very, very short compared to what we've seen before. We have uh, entrance into this code here, an entrance into this uh, function main. And then we have this instruction. Remember, this is basically what uh, creates the uh, padding offset kind of thing. And then ESP is decremented by 50 in this instruction. And then gets is called. So basically, the... Um, Space for buffer is allocated here, and then gets is called on that buffer. Uh, actually, buffer is at ESP plus 10. So as you can see, again, the buffer size is 50 minus 10 hex 40, which is 64, just like it was allocated in the C program. Uh, and then we have an exit of this procedure. So the return here, uh, again, we want this, we want to take control of the instruction pointer. If the program just returns to where it was called from, then we really have no exploit. So what we really want to do is overwrite the instruction, uh, the EIP extended instruction pointer, uh, and let us point it to our shell code. So if we go online, it's very easy to find shell code. You can just Google it. Um, this site here, it's called uh, shellstorm.org. It has a lot of um, uh, shell code samples here, but the one that we're going to use just because it's really small uh, and it does the job. It's the ex, uh, exec ve bin sh. This will uh, basically execute a shell here. And here we have it. This is the uh, basically the disassembly of what we're going to be injecting. Uh, and then here is the actual uh, exploit um, bytes that we can put in. So if we can somehow get the machine to run these bytes, then we've got a shell. Okay, well, you say, how do we get the machine to run those bytes? Well, we have a buffer. We can use our buffer as a place to store stuff and then basically find a way to execute that stuff in our buffer. So let us uh, kind of draw everything out real quick. So right now we have a buffer. Let's just say this is our buffer. Oh, gosh, that was a terrible buffer. Um, rectangle. Okay, so we have something like this. And... Remember, EIP, or sorry, ESP, will be pointing somewhere, uh, we don't know where it points, ESP up here, but remember our buffer starts at ESP plus hex 10. Like this. Right, because that's what we saw in the disassembly, is uh, ESP plus hex 10. So after this, remember we have Actually, let's see if it's um, if it runs the same. So let's um, let's break here after after this instruction because this is the one that 
we kind of don't know what's going to happen. And then let's run it. And then let's uh, look at the registers. Yes, so again, it, it does the exact same thing. In fact, I think the numbers are even the same. So you see ESP and EBP are just a difference of the last four, and in this case, it's eight. So there's a padding there of size eight that basically is allocated. Um, so right here, we have a padding of size eight. So I should have drawn that a little bit bigger. After that, though, is the, um, is the EBP. So EBP really points here. And um, this, remember, EBP always points to the saved EBP. This is, we know this just because of the stack structure. And then below the EBP, in, in other words, in, in the higher address, we have the return uh, address. For whatever function called main, that's the return address where it's going to return after that. And we know that this is EBP plus 4. Okay, and below that we don't know what what's going on. It's just it's just wilderness essentially. But we know we have this little bit here, and we know we have a buffer here. Okay, so with this shell code that I uh, pulled up here, we see that it's twenty uh, twenty eight bytes, and remember our buffer is of size sixty four. So. What we really would like to do is get the program to return and start executing our shell code. But um, as you will see, uh, if we run the program from a different location, um, for example, from a different uh, directory, we may get the addresses a little bit off. And that could be bad because if it started executing within our shell code, that wouldn't really work. And if it executed uh, before, if it jumped too early, uh, or jump to an address that was too low, then we may get some really unexpected behavior. So we really like to guarantee that our shell code is executed. And how do we do that? Well, there's a standard method um, to do this. Basically, we're going to load the shell code at the bottom of this buffer here, this sink here, and our shell code is just going to go here. So of course, this is not drawn to proportion. Uh, it might be, but probably not. And so this is our shell code. Um, and then before this, we, we don't want it to be random. We don't want it to be random bytes. And the reason for this is because if they are random and we jump to there, we will get unexpected behavior uh, because the bytes will tell the EIP to do some stuff that, I mean, it, the buffer wasn't supposed to be executed in the first place and we're executing it. So, you know, we get some weird stuff. The way to address this is to find some instruction where the instruction pointer will just tick along, tick along, tick along till it reaches our shell code. And that, my friends, is a knob slide. And it's also called a knob sled, whatever, whatever it is. But the general idea is like this. So imagine you have a rough hill here. At the bottom of a hill is a big lava pit. And this lava pit here is basically our shell code, right? We want to get um, something. Actually, I shouldn't have drawn this little uh, ridge here. Let me let me fix that actually. Um, oh no. We want to get something just to fall down this hill and hit this lava pit, right? So the way we do this is basically our knobs will do that for us. If we just have knobs, uh, if we have just a string of knobs here, our processor will just read the knob and be like, oh. Do nothing, so go to the next one. Do nothing, so go to the next one. And I'll just go and fall down this hill and reach, execute our shell code. So essentially, we want something to be thrown on this hill somewhere, and then that object will just roll down, and we will have shell. OK, so how do we do that? Well, we have to find the address of somewhere within this knob, uh, maybe somewhere halfway within the knob or something like that. And the reason we want the halfway within the knob and not something that just starts at the knob is imagine what if um, our stack were located at somewhere higher in memory. So for example, if we have, uh, we know that environment variables are stored on the stack. What if there were fewer environment variables in, in stored in the stack? Well, then what would happen is we'd be executing, if we jumped to the beginning, right, uh, from one, uh, from our original 
uh, code, we would be jumping to somewhere that is like up here um, above our buffer and we get unexpected behavior. So we don't want to do that. At the same time, we don't also don't want to obviously to put it at the end of the knob slide. That would, that would kind of defeat the purpose of the whole knob slide. So to maximize the air, room for error here, we'll just put a smack dab in the middle. So remember, our shell code um, was um, 28 bytes. So 64 minus our 28 here will give us 36 bytes of knob slide. That, our knob slide should be 36 bytes in length. So we should be aiming for somewhere 18 uh, bytes above the beginning. In other words, we're looking for ESP plus hex 10, and then we want ESP plus hex 10 plus hex 12, right? Because 18 is, um, is 12, essentially. And this is just equal to plus 22. So we just want ESP plus 22. This is where we'd like to store our return address. So let's go back to the uh, disassembly here. Oh my gosh, what is going on? Oh boy. Okay, good, we still have it on, that's good. Okay, um, so ESP, we wanna look at what happens after it's decremented by 50. So we'll just take a step. So SI is GDB for just step. And then let's take a look at info registers again. All right, so as expected, ESP goes down to 50 here from the A0 that we have up here. So 50 plus 22, or hex 22, is give us uh, 72, right? So we want our exploit to jump to our return address here, to go to our return address. Let me put this one in red here. Our return address should be um, hex uh, B... F, 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 B, F, 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 seven, seven, two. Because in this way, we'll have the 10, and then we'll have halfway through the knob slide. Okay, so this is what we're going to write. This is the end of our buffer is going to be this thing. What about the save DBP? Well, remember, that's four bytes. So we'll just write four bytes of some random character. Let's just say that one is B. So we'll write B four times there. And then for this padding here, we'll do A's. We'll fill it up with A's, remember? So padding is eight bytes, so we'll do eight A's. Shell code is already our shell code. We'll just copy that over from the website. And then the NOP, um, NOP is in x86 is hex 90. So we're going to do hex 90, basically, uh, times uh, th uh, 36. All right, so let's go ahead and go to a temporary folder and write our exploit. So let's go to temp. All right, let's vim stack 5 exploit.python. Okay, first thing we want to do, remember, is knob slide. And this is... 90 times 36. After our knob slide, we would like to place our shell code. So our shell code is going to be, um, we can just copy it from this website here. So, okay. All right, and then let's just remove the, yep. Just remove these uh, extra things here. All right, there we go. So that's our shell code. Um, I'm not going to count that, but it said it was 28 bytes, so I'm going to take its word for that. Padding. For padding, I'm going to combine the um, actual like padding and the uh, and the overwrite the EBP together. So you see we have 12 characters there. And then our return address is going to point back into our buffer midway between the knobs, remember. And I wrote the address down, but I forgot it. It's, okay, so 72F7FFBF.
All right. So let me just check that just to make sure I have everything right. So it was 50 plus 22. Yeah, that should be correct. Okay, so now let's go back here and uh, return address. Yeah, now let's make our payload. Which is just the concatenation of everything. I'm just going to print payload. Ooh, nice. Live overflow. Okay, and that. Okay, now we're just going to Python it into an exploit file. All right, cat exploit. So you see we have what we want here, bin sh. It's kind of weird how it looks right now, but yeah. Okay, now we can just execute it. So um, remember it used git, so we can just simply pipe it. Um, but to keep the, the pipe open after the shell is run, we have to do, we have to cat again. Um, and you'll see this with lots of, uh, different, um, uh, buffer overflows where you have to run shell code. You have to keep the pipe open. So you, you run cat after you do cat exploit, or you can just run cat with an empty parameter and it'll keep the, uh, pipe open so you can actually run the shell there and then opt to star bin stack five. All right, so let's check out who am I? Oops. Root. Wow, we got root access here. Let's check out our ID. So yeah, and then let's check out if we can run bash. Ooh, bash here. Great. Oh, and we got a stopped here. So essentially, we see that we've successfully run the shell here, um, but I don't know. Ooh, and we got exit. Huh, that's weird. Oh well, but we still got, um, we still run an instruction here. We basically still ran as root. So who am I root? This is the important part here. We were able to run the shell. So yeah, we've exploited um, stack five from Protostar. Uh, the next two exploits are very similar, I think. I think I'll probably do them together in one video, just to keep it short. And then after that, we'll take a look at the next section, format. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. I hope uh, you enjoyed this. Uh, if you have any problems with the shell code, uh, you can discuss that in the comments. Otherwise, take care, and I'll see you in stack 6 and 7.